Here with Scott Emerson, Oakland A's uh, Major League Pitching Coach uh, since 2015, but grew up in Arizona, uh, high school baseball, Juco baseball, and then, and then signed out of, out of junior college and uh, been in pro ball for a long time now. So, Scott, thanks for jumping on with me. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, I, is the 20-round draft better for baseball? You know, I mean, the, the opportunity for, you know, players to uh, prove themselves, you know, kind of gets diminished a little bit because uh, not as many players, you know, obviously get into affiliate ball right away. But I think what Major League Baseball is doing with the partner leagues, uh, you know, is good to get as many players out playing baseball and, you know, ch keeping their dreams alive, you know. Uh, you know, 20 rounds is, you know, short and quick. And, and there are a lot of late bloomers and guys that, uh, in my opinion, you know, they don't blossom to around 23, 24 years old. And if they don't get drafted, they got to go somewhere to play. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's really uh, awesome that uh, Major League Baseball has partnered with a lot of other uh, leagues. Probably the only way you could do it. The reason I ask is you're, a, a you know, a 21st rounder out of high school and a 40th rounder out of junior college so obviously that that kicks a guy like you out and you had a great career yeah I mean um you know I had a little injury going into junior college at Scottsdale Community College and uh you're right you know if uh it was 20 rounds I, I may not have been drafted that year uh but uh you know I, I think that uh you know baseball generally gets the players right at some point in time you know if you're good they're going to find you yeah. any chance of you going to a four-year school after Scottsdale? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I signed to go to Arizona state. Um, you know, I had some, uh, you know, basketball plans, maybe still in my, my range of that. So, uh, you know, that's basically why, you know, one of the reasons why I took, uh, uh, the opportunity to go to Scottsdale community college and junior college was to keep, uh, some basketball in my future. But, uh, Larry Smith was the head coach at, uh, Scottsdale Community College. He coached in professional baseball as well. Coached a lot, you know. Coached at Duke. Coached at uh, uh, Northwestern, uh, Indiana, and he was a big influence on me about just you know being a pitching guy, somebody that you know you could go to who was a uh, guy coaching professionals. And I thought you know you know what you know what better way to try to get into the professional ranks in baseball than going to a guy who's actually in it at the time. You know, those were the times when those junior college coaches could coach pro ball in the off season. And I felt like, you know, Coach Smith had a great knowledge of, of you know, not only baseball, but mentoring me as a person. And, uh, you know, his pitching stuff was, you know, something that impressed me. How are you able to balance <laughs> basketball and baseball? You know, um, it's tough because, you know, you, you wanted to be really good in both sports. And, uh, you know, I, I always – you know, had that baseball ambition in my mind that that was the, the the goal of mine. You know, basketball was always something in the back of my mind as well. But I also, you know, basketball coach Jerry Connors, I shot him out in high school. You know, uh, when Mike Bibby took over and coach, they got a couple state championships and Mike Bibby took over and they took off in the basketball realm. But, you know, the conditioning, the aspect of, you know, Coach Connors making us run stadiums all day. I mean, basketball practice started at 2.30. We didn't touch a basketball to 4 o'clock. So, you know, a lot of our guys were in shape. We, we, we played the run and gun offense. And, and it just helped me become a better athlete, in my opinion, make me move a little bit better by playing a lot of basketball. How did you keep your arm up during basketball? Well, sometimes, you know, Coach Connors played – he was actually – he played both sports at uh, Grand Canyon University, basketball and baseball. So sometimes we'd throw in the gym and, and play catch, you know, starting around the uh, end of December and getting ready for baseball season. On on uh, game days, you know, we played seven 7.30 at night. You know, our school at Shadow Mountain, we, get, we got done at 2 o'clock. I'd head over to the field at 2.45 and – get my throwing in, throw a bullpen, go home, do some homework, grab something to eat and be at the second gym at five o'clock for shoot around. So it, it was a busy day, but, uh, you know, I wanted to be good at two sports and, and keep my options open. And, and, but baseball was my first love. How are you managing your time? I mean, were you doing anything specifically? That's a long schedule. So were you doing anything specifically to manage your time? Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, Dr. John Maxwell wrote in a book one time, uh, you know, you don't manage your time, you manage your life. And, and it's one of the quotes that, you know, I've kind of really gone back and thought about 
over my career is how, how well did I manage my life? You know, uh, what was I doing? And, and um, you know, when you're playing two sports, you just got to, you know, you know, summer baseball was, was a little bit more important than summer basketball, but uh, fall basketball was more important than, than fall baseball. You know, I'd still keep it going because, it, you know, in Arizona at the time we had the Phoenix winter league, which was a, which uh, we played on the weekends and we played one game a week and uh, you know, we divided the East uh, Valley from the West Valley and had an all-stars game. And then we had a little um, series uh, with some teams that came in through Doyle baseball, man, that's, that's dating ourselves. This is, you know, 32 years ago when I graduated, you know, we didn't have the travel ball per se, like uh, is going on now. We actually had, you know, a league, you know, we had uh one side of Phoenix played Babe Ruth baseball, 18 and under, and the other side played Connie Mack, but they kind of mixed mixed in with the schedules and played each other. And we only had three American Legion teams in the whole state. So they would mix in some games. And uh, you know, summer baseball in Arizona was crazy. But what I loved about it is it was a league. It wasn't just a showcase. We, you know, you had a five-man rotation. We I think one year for the Garden of Gears, uh, we played 60 games. And it was pretty much 60 games in like 70 days. So you were pitching every fifth day like pro ball and you were getting your innings. I think I threw like 80 innings that summer right around there. And um, we had uh, Arizona had a, the first area code team that year. And uh, I went to the area code games. Uh, so, I mean, it was just a, 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 a great dynamic of actually playing in a league rather than just playing on weekends. How did you know when it was time to be finished? Oh man, the game pretty much told me. I mean, uh, you know, I I got a back, I had a back injury in my career, um, two broken bones, L four and L five, and I just couldn't, I couldn't get out, I couldn't move, you know, I just couldn't move as good. I I remember talking about having a back surgery, and they wanted to fuse my lower back, and I said, so you know, what what's the rehab process? And the doctor said, rehab process, it's 50-50 whether you come back. And I'm like, well, I'll just keep throwing stuff off the backstop and seeing if somebody's gonna keep pit, you know, keep wanting to pitch me. So, you know, I um, you know, I, I ended not not throwing the ball like I should have probably. I, I just couldn't feel the baseball anymore when I couldn't really rotate or or do anything. So I I kind of knew it was time. Were you having a hard time throwing strikes then with your back? Yeah, I just I just couldn't put my body in that really good position, you know, and, uh, you know, working out at the time didn't really, you know, help me. I just didn't feel like I got to a point where, you know, I was physically strong enough to make pitches. I loved the game. I wanted to stick around for, you know, probably a few more years than I probably should have. But, um, you know, when you when you can't put your body in a good position to make pitches, you're not going to make many pitches. Did you have more fun coaching in the Mexican league or in the Arizona fall league? Oh, wow. I mean, that that's great. I mean, I mean, you look at uh, our Arizona fall league team. I mean, just our three catchers were Suzuki, Salty, Monte, uh, Salty, and Montero. I mean, then you got Loney, Sherholtz, Tony Abreu's, uh, Stephen Drew, uh, uh, LaRoche, uh, Camp and Ethier and Pridey and, Casey Daigle and Jamie Shields and, and, and those guys, I mean, those were guys that, that all became, you know, really, really good major league players. But, you know, when, when you go down to the, uh, to the Mexican league, uh, you, you, you're on somebody else's turf per se, and you, you really get to see players enjoy playing, you know, in their surroundings. And, you know, just for me to start learning some Spanish or better Spanish, and understanding how to order a meal, you know, you go out by yourself or you're, and you're stuck in a situation and you're, you're pointing at the menu rather than reading it. And then you're, you know, sometimes you're eating something you're like, man, I don't even know what's in this thing. But, uh, and so now you start developing that appreciation for what the Latin players and, and the, uh, the Asian players that come over that don't speak English, uh, you know, have to go through. I mean, can, can you imagine, uh, you know, being in a country and, just, you know, I was just kind of thrown in. Here you go. But I was fortunate. I had Carlos Chavez, who now is a pitching coach with the uh, San Diego Padres organization. We played together in 1992. And here we are in 2004. He's my setup man for the Los Mochis Quineros. So that, that was always a good thing. I had him as my uh, he always says I, I owe him a bunch of stuff for being an interpreter. 
they do say that's the the easiest way and the best way to learn a different language is to go immerse yourself in that culture for those reasons because you're adjusting on the fly to the to the language barrier. Yeah, just, just you know, uh, you know, communication skills. Now you got to start learning how to communicate without the language. I mean, I got I got the pitching term language. You know, all right. Uh, you know, it's but you know, you're you're being a little bit more tactical. You're, you're putting your hands on the player, and and you know, comprende really became a big word. Comprende, you know, and, and yes, and and uh, so being able to understand that, you know, most people are visual learners, but uh, when you start, you know, putting your hands on somebody and and then trying to use video to help them out as well. I think they became better learners because they had to concentrate on what I was trying to get across. Hey, with the Arizona Fall League, are they making any sort of adjustments or tweaks, or is it just go out and, and compete in the Fall League? You know, I think, you know, a lot of guys do a really good job of, uh, you know, processing information from organizations and what their players are out there to to try to do. It, it's still a, a development league, but it's a showcase development league. You know, it's a, a glorified all-star game. And, uh, you know, I think Major League Baseball does a great job of putting these players in front of, you know, 30, 40, 50 scouts every night and letting these players go out and showcase their skills. And uh, you hey, know, they didn't the scouts- come in like each guy, different orgs, because that's the interesting thing with the Arizona Fall League is because it's not just one organization. It's multiple organizations on a team. Did those guys not roll in with like, hey, here's what the org wants me to try to work on this fall? Or was it, hey, we're just going to kind of watch and, and see what you got? No, we, we had a lot of Zoom uh, or not Zoom back then. We just had right. conference calls, you know, <laughs> we weren't face to face, you know, the conference calls of what, you know, the Dodgers expectations of, of a player are, what, what they want to do with them. Uh, you know, uh, the Arizona Diamondbacks were on our team, the, the, the Rays were there and the Braves. So we, we had a great collection of farm directors that, that I would talk to, pitching coordinators around the league that I would talk to uh, for those teams. And, and, you know, they would try to reiterate, hey, this is what we're trying to do with this player. Uh, here's the drills and then go ahead and add on to what you think you can get these guys uh, better with terminology the same from organization to organization or is it different with different organizations from terminology of coaching and and maybe mechanical stuff yeah you you know everybody's you know we're moving into the the new terminologies of you know know, horizontal break and vertical approach angle and and all uh, you know we we don't throw to soft contact anymore we throw to low exit velo i mean i could go on and on and on i I think it's still the same thing isn't it it's still the same thing. I mean, I, I like to tell people, you know, I, I dropped a baseball down in my swimming pool in 1983. I went down and got it and I used it as a weighted ball. So, I mean, th- these things have been around, you know, but, uh, you know, the terminology may change, but the message should stay the same. Yep. Yep. How'd you get to North Carolina? Oh, one of my uh, good friends is a uh, former major league player, Trot Nixon. And I was in his wedding in 1996 and uh, met my wife. Wife at the wedding. My wife and his wife, you know, were best friends from probably week three of their eight. You know, they they grew up in diapers together, and uh, we were both in the wedding. My wife Jill and I, and and then uh, Trot and Catherine were in our wedding in two thousand and one. So it's a it's a great friendship. Uh, you know, I wish I could see him more. He lives uh, about two and a half, three hours from me. But what an amazing person, a, a, a awesome resource, and and. Uh, you know, fiery guy that loves the game of baseball. How'd you get involved with the Czech Republic? Well, uh, Trot and I got involved with Jay Stott, who uh, owned a um, a baseball, you know, uh, uh, travel team called Purpose Driven Baseball, and he uh, went on a uh, trip to uh, to Prague, and he was sitting at a business meeting, and and one of the uh, parents of a Czech player said, hey, I got to leave this meeting early and go uh, to a baseball game. And, and my buddy Jay was like a baseball game in the Czech Republic. So uh, he started talking to, to the uh, to the father. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, we're going on some baseball mission trips to the Czech Republic. And then Jay uh, was able to get uh, some of the guys he knows as their national coaches and uh, who now – since uh, Jay had purpose driven baseball, now he has Pro Five Baseball Academy here in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, a 
kind of an academy's high school team that uh, you know has been pr- producing a lot of Division One and college players. Yeah, love it. But you know, you've had experience with a language barrier then too. So did did that make it a little bit easier going over there from a language barrier piece? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, in a lot of European countries, they they know a lot of a lot of English, so it made it a, a little bit easier going over there. You know, I've been over there six times and, and always tried to hit another city. We, we met with the the um, the Irish National Baseball Federation one year. We've been into into Spain. We've been into uh, Germany with Martin Bruner over there. So it, it's been a great uh, great organization to be able to to go over there and uh, you know uh, instill our faith, but also you know drive baseball and you know mostly build relationships with people. And uh, through baseball and just, you know, we're there for you and, uh, you know, get to know other people around the world is exciting. Do elite pitchers want to be coached? A hundred percent. I mean, I I can always say that uh, pretty much the elite pitchers are the A students. Uh, They, but what they can do is they can filter the information. You know, they're a little bit more freakish per se. They don't have to be as coached as much because they just got so much, ability they can go out and do but you know they want to be better just like everybody else you know even guys that aren't elite want to be better but you got to understand them you know who can process the information i think elite pitchers process information really well and understand what they should use and what they should not use how are you helping rookies when they get to you I mean, it's an adjustment correct going from whether double a triple a or the big leagues yeah I, you know I, i've had the the privilege uh, to coach pretty much every level of the minor leagues and be able to go to Mexico and the Arizona Fall League. And each level means something, but the biggest jump is by far AAA to the big leagues. These big league hitters are really, really good. And, you know, sometimes good coaching is just kind of slowing it down. You know, I think last year I, I slowed it down a little bit on these rookies, so we had a lot of them. You know, and I wanted to go out there and let them breathe and, and watch them pitch a little bit before you kind of – you know, go in and grind on them. Uh, you know, last year we all know wasn't going to be probably a great year for the for the Oakland A's. So it was a good opportunity to to kind of let guys go out there, uh, a pitch a little bit. And you know, I think this year now that you know, hopefully we've built that relationship and they've they've towed that mound enough that that we can start really making some adjustments, the the, the necessary adjustments to take their game to a whole nother level. I think they're. Uh, they're all going to be really uh, confident in their abilities. And uh, now we just got to get them to understand, okay, here's some of the things you did last year. Tell me what you liked. I'll tell you what we need to make an adjustment on. And now this year I think is going to be a, a better year for us in, in the terms of being able to kind of tinker a lo- around a little bit. Because you can't pile on at that point with a young one because you know he's probably going to get banged around a little bit, right? Like you can't pile on as a coach at that point, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of mound trips where, you know, you go out to the mound and it's like, hey, I, I need you to breathe a little bit. That's the first thing you're talking to these guys about is breathing. And uh, look, we got a lot of great guys, a lot of guys that have, you know, good skill sets. Now it's about piecing it together, understanding how to pitch at the big league level, you know, uh, polishing up your movements. You know, I always say that, you know, and I think I can say this because I've been at but at every level is that your your you know biomechanics are important. We love it. But when you get to the big leagues, I'm hoping it's all about game planning and polishing up your biomechanics to a to a degree of when you've done something that's different, we can recognize it and get you back on course. The toughest thing for me is to take a major league pitcher and change them and start to think, well, you know, these changes probably should have been done at the minor league level because uh that's where they're not in, in per se worrying about winning a baseball game about the big leagues is, you know, as a result orientated business, you know, Bob Melvin taught me that real quick. Hey man, this is about results. And uh, yes, there is some breathing room to make these mechanical adjustments, but you really want guys to get to the big leagues and have their mechanics honed in and have their arsenal honed in. And then that way you can, you know, you use the data. I love the data. I love the data. I use the data to, okay, well, if your arm slots lower, your arm slots higher, you're doing something different. You're out of the kinetic chain or you're, you're late, or, you know, there's a difference between um, a delay and late, you know, in the arm action and, and all this stuff 
is great and, and I love it, but uh, it serves its purpose. And you just got to make sure, you know, at high levels dealing with high athletes that results are still what you're looking for. If you see a guy who's consistently late, what type of adjustments are you going to try to to make with him? Well, I, I always, you know, you know, take away how the ball's coming out of the glove. How, how fast are we leaving the rubber? Are we leaving the rubber? Are we anchored into the ground? Uh, are we on our heel? Are we on our, our, our toe? Uh, are we glute dominant or are we quad dominant? You know, I think, you know, you know, now in the game, everybody, I would say everybody teaches everybody to be in the ground and, and they talk ground force and, uh, you know, more so glute dominant guys. But, uh, you know, there are a, a lot of quad dominant, good major league pitchers. So the the, the one thing that I look hey, at. Give an every, example. Give an example of a quad dominant big league pitcher. Well, a quad dominant. Uh, oh, an example. of a Yeah. Quad do you have dominant. an individual? I mean, can you name can you name an individual? you have yeah i mean well i'll, I'll give you a, like a, a certain profile most most like quad dominant guys for me are are uh you know they're rotating early they're sitting in their glute they, they they're going to have a controlled uh type fall kind of sit into their glute which is a little bit of a squat and then they rotate and turn it into a lunge where a um a quad dominant guy is going to be a little bit taller. He's going to turn in a little bit more. He's not going to sit into his legs as much. He's going to work more what I call top to bottom. So I, I think a lot of glute guys, if you categorize them, are more drop and drive type pitchers that we used to say. And the quad dominant guys are tall and fall type guys. And I think a lot of more people are tall and fall than they are drop and drive uh, because the zone is below everybody's eyes, per se. We are on a, tel a 10 inch elevated surface, so we have to drive the baseball you know, down to, to, th to throw strikes. But uh, we're in this world of ground force and getting everybody in the ground and, and to throw harder. And, you know, when I'm building a pitcher, I'm not building them to throw harder. I'm building them to throw a strike. And then we work, we work from the plate backwards. And then I want guys who who throw strikes hard, not guys who throw hard but no strikes. You know, so you know, it, there's a big difference here. There's throwing and there's pitching, and and uh, we got to get back to our guys being major league pitchers and not minor league throwers because we don't want to go through uh, you know 50 guys a season. Uh, pitch it on the mound and and we want to be able to build sustainable starters who can actually go through a lineup three times uh and when you go through a lineup three times generally those are good strike throwers is it easier or harder to coach pitchers now with the amount of information that's out there uh, i think it's a lot harder uh you know everybody has a facility coach which is fine uh, but if the message isn't received, uh, both directions and people collaborating and working together, it becomes really difficult. You know, um, pitching coaches at the big league or any level, uh, you know, we talked about the results. And, uh, you know, it, it's one thing to get into a facility and throw it as hard as you can and, and not hit the target. But it's another thing to have that guy in the facility. And there's a lot of great facility guys who understand, hey, let's throw, let's have what I call useful velocity. Let's work the zone. Let's let's throw it to the top of the zone for a strike. And let's start quantifying that information as being good. Because you you know, you know, and purposeful coached. misses too. Like that that's the other part of command is is being able to miss purposefully, whether it's it's go up the ladder or expand off. Like that that's a command component as well. Uh, 100%. You know, the ability, you know, I always say pitching is the act of throwing a, a, a pitch inside or outside the strike zone at will. And, you know, the best big league pitchers, you know, they're not even in the zone 50% of the time anymore because the guys are swinging outside the zone because when they use their fastball, it's good enough to be located. And then they get them chasing those balls outside the strike zone. But, you know, back to the facility guys they're 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 very very important and if they're not on the same page as the pitching coach when they get there then just misinformation and, and things can you know really turn for the pitcher so for me I'm always trying to listen to the pitcher you know what do you want to do how do you want to do it and if I don't like it I, I you know I tell them and uh you know everything should be you know geared toward that command and then 
you know, how can we get you to throw harder with command? It's not how we can get you to throw command by throwing harder because, you know, when you're coaching college baseball, high school baseball, if the guy, you know, got a 96 mile an hour fastball and 2,600 spin rate and it hits the backstop, you're not going to pitch him. So let's get these guys in the zone first and keep developing that velo as we're getting them in the zone. Yeah, we talked in the last year at lunch talking about the amount of data you crunch for game planning and, and attacking hitters. Go over that process just a little bit with, with what you're taking and then how you're helping pitchers with their arsenal figure out how they're going to get guys out. You know, uh, the, the one term we've always used in this game is, or the new term is the uh, pitch design. You know, I truly believe if you haven't been pitch designing, you're not doing your job. You know, we've been working on spins and movements and, and arm slots, you know, since the game has begun. And then tunneling, you know, the ability to, to make the pitches look the same. I, I remember in, uh, man, 2012 at Papago Park, we had – the first portable track man and we mounted it up uh, behind home plate with track man. They were running wires out there. It was great until it melted, you know, <laughs> this thing melted out there. But uh, you know, I was, I, I called it tree branching at the time. I guess I lost out to tunneling. You know, I said, you know, be the tree, be the bark of the tree and then start branching off. And, and I kept asking them, I want to know when these pitches start branching off, when they start moving. And at the time, Trackman was like, well, we're just supplying the data. We don't we don't know any of that stuff. But uh, when it comes to game planning, you know, the best elite major league pitchers, they have the ability to, to exploit a hitter's weakness with a strength. And that's why, you know, you got to have the ability to throw your fastball to all quadrants of the plate, up, down, in and out, back and forth, you know, being able to move that thing around. And it's not how many times uh, you're using your fastball. It's when you use it are you able to command the ball and, and make it effective? So, you know, the, the pitcher's ability to, to, you know, go up and in, down and away, hard away, soft away. You know, every hitter has a hole. You know, where can I go with my fastball? We all know that, you know, breaking balls down and away in general are going to be pretty good. And then breaking balls below the zone in general are going to be pretty good as well because, uh, you know, those pitches are tough to hit. Now you're kind of chasing data, you know, where does this guy handle his fastball? Where does he handle his fastball for damage? Uh, what can he do behind in the count? Uh, can I go soft? You know, a lot of behind the count stuff, I look for, uh, you know, low exit below. I got to throw a strike. You know, I want to win this count. I got to get back in this count. I got to throw a strike here. Where does he hit it but doesn't, you know, do damage? And so the, the numbers that we get, uh, I mean, they're just amazing of how much numbers we get. So we, we surf a lot of that. Sometimes it's just strength on strength, especially when you have, you know, the rookie pitchers, you know, and sometimes you're going to get beat by that because now you're increasing the success rate of a hitter because this is a strength. This is what he does. And sometimes this is what pitchers do. Now, if you're an elite guy going strength on strength, you know, you probably got more of a chance to get, you know, something positive in your favor. If you're, if you're not, an elite guy going strength on strength the hitter gains the advantage but you still have a good advantage going strength on strength but can you exploit the hitter's weakness with a strength and that's kind of how you you know come up with your game plan but it's also how you're developing your pitcher can you go into a lefty with a fastball can you go soft away to a lefty for with, with something backdoor breaker if you're right-handed change up if you're right-handed uh can you sink it away to a lefty uh can you cut it into a lefty and then, you know, just flip that a left-hander on a right-hander. Can you go hard in, soft away? Can you go hard away, soft away? And when you do that, you match up the data and you start formulating a good game plan. Hey, if you had to go to the high school or college level, what things would stick out to you as far as changing, maybe changing a pitcher's pitch arsenal off their fastball, whether it's curveball, slider, cutter, like what would you look for if you're a, a, a coach at a college or high school? Well, one of the things, obviously, fastball command really sticks out for me because you, you can, uh, you know, you, you use that uh, term effective velocity. You know, you run something up by somebody's eyes. It appears harder than the, the fastball that you ran away. And uh, I always love that term because, you know, if you look at an airplane up in the sky, you think that thing 
it isn't moving very fast and then that thing lands in front of your eyes and it's moving fast. So the, the power of using your fastball is so important. I, I believe a lot of guys don't want to use their fastball right now because well, uh, some of it's know, the big league numbers and the college numbers have gotten skewed towards a lot more breaking balls. Yeah, we're, we're trending towards more breaking balls because it's a swing and miss thing. But I also it's trending more to breaking balls because, quite frankly, guys are throwing it as hard as they can and and probably more don't know where it's really going. So they'd rather spin it inside the strike zone and and then, uh, you know, have the hitter determine what's going on rather than execute that. Uh, command fastball. And I think elite pitchers, they don't have to throw it that much. You know, 50% of their time is fine, but they're throwing it 65 to 72% strikes. And that's what makes them elite because hitters always have to respect that fastball and look for that breaking ball. But I think, you know, high school and college pitchers, you know, that changeup is is a really effective weapon. It's the lowest exit velo pitch in baseball. You know, it sometimes has a high uh, weighted average, and some of that's due because it, you know, it, it finds its holes. But, you know, if hitting's timing, pitching is disruption of timing, how am I going to disrupt a, a hitter's time? Uh, it's really hard for hitters to practice hitting changeups. Uh, you know, they got the velo machine. They got the breaking mold machine. I haven't really seen a changeup machine. Maybe you know of one, but I haven't seen it. So I think uh, the change Only when you the... throw a, a beat up ball in there every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, one. seat shifted wake, right? Uh, <laughs> that, that catches a catches the air current and moves the ball. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, high school and college pitchers, if you want to be a big league pitcher, I think you got to look at big picture thinking. And having that ability to throw that fastball uh, when I need to use it to where it needs to go is powerful. And, you know, the slider, the break ball, the slider is the number one swing and miss pitch. I think, you know, the data tells us that. So we should be developing, you know, some sliders. And, and you know, a curveball is a, is a good pitch as well. You know, any breaking ball that's got some, some speed to it, it's always tough to hit. You know, I always laugh when people write down or, you know, I, I always say, let me write that down. When they put, if you want a better breaking ball, throw it harder. And I always laugh. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you want a better fastball, throw that harder too. So, you know, anything harder with movement is tough. But, uh, you know, in the big leagues, they can time a bullet. So if you constantly are a fastball guy and you keep throwing fastball after fastball after fastball, uh, you know, these hitters are really good. And that's where, you know, something soft, that's where, you know, if you can't throw a good changeup, throw that slow curveball. But I think everybody should probably put a slider in their pocket. When you're scripting a game out, like who may match up with, with this hitter, then how often does it work out the way you expect it to work out? Oh, uh, you know, uh, generally, you know, obviously it works because hitters in the big leagues last year, you know, the batting average is 232. So, you know, we still have the advantage, right? Uh, you know, there, there's some, uh, you know, obviously there's great hitters. They're the best hitters in the world, these big league guys. And, and, you know, we, we, all, we always look at uh, when it doesn't work, you know, but uh, it, it works out more times than it doesn't. But, you know, we do a great job, our, our analytical department and our skipper, Mark Kotze, of sitting down before the game and having a process of, you know, if these guys come up and these relievers are available, you know, here's our go-to guys in this situation. Here's our go-to guys in that situation. You know, the scoreboard board means a lot too. You know, you're up six or seven runs. You're probably not going to use one guy in a situation in a six. You might hold off and, and go somewhere else. And, um, you know, that's where the data really helps us out. And, and it comes in the matchup sheet that we have of who we want facing who in, in crunch time. And, uh, you know, how, how much are you sharing that with your players? How much, of, um, how much mean, of like percentage of what you guys talk about among yourselves, how much of that information is, is then getting shared with the players? Well, uh, you know, our guys know kind of their roles, you know, the, the, the roles, you know, I laugh, uh, Joe Sparks, long time uh, major league coach, minor league coach. He always used to say your role is if you pitch good, you pitch long. If you pitch bad, you pitch short. You know, that was his role. So you're always trying to, you know, tell the guys, you know, where you sit, you know, you know, you, you'll see some guys come out uh, of the clubhouse in the fifth inning and go down to the bullpen because they're kind of our late inning guys. Some days you got to go to him and say, Hey, I need you in the, I need you in the bullpen in the third inning. So we always try to keep our guys prepared, but you know, they, they start pitching their themselves into their roles 
And uh, we try to give them the, the best heads up we possibly can. The toughest thing is, you, you know, you, you're you in a big league game. You tell a guy, hey, you're pitching tonight. And all of a sudden he doesn't pitch tonight. So you always got to protect yourself from you don't want to say one thing and it never come true. I mean, how are you handling guys that maybe aren't happy with their role that they're in? I mean, I always tell them, you know, especially in the big leagues, you're pretty happy every two weeks. I mean, you're getting paid, a, you know, a, a good amount of money. I mean, you know, obviously our guys want to pitch in crunch time. I mean, they're 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 no dummies. You know, they they want to they want the ball. You know, I think I think I've been fortunate in our organization that we get a lot of guys who want the baseball and they want it in crunch time. But they also they're true professionals and they start understanding you know their opportunities and their roles and and they understand it really well now what's going on. And uh, hey, you do, know, you feel, gotta... do you feel like that's due to your scouting department and player development department uh, with either drafting players that that want the ball in crunch time or helping develop that in the minor leagues? Yeah, I, I think it's just the mindset that uh, we've created. You know, I've always tried to create the uh, the you know when the phone rings, then that's your opportunity. You know, I, I look at Chris Bassett. I mean, Chris Bassett is one of my favorites of all time. And he was kind of in that hybrid starting relieving role and, and always would uh, not get upset, but frustrated, wanted, wanted a defined role. And I remember having a conversation with him and he said, you know what, Emo, just you know, pitch me when you pitch me. When the phone rings, I'll be ready. And from then on, in my opinion, this guy has been one of the best pitchers in Major League Baseball. Just to watch this guy blossom into a guy that, you know, uh, might not have had the, the best command at one to kind of a, 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 a not effectively wild, but kind of a, a controlled guy that, uh, you know, some people would say effectively wild, kind of Lucy delivery all over the place a little bit at times. Watch this guy honus his delivery. Watch this guy throw bullpens in um, 2019 and 2020. I, I would turn to our bullpen coach at the time, Marcus Jensen, and say, man, this guy's dotting in the bullpen. This is, this is, this is awesome. This guy is turning the corner. And uh, not that he didn't throw good bullpens before, but he he started controlling his delivery. You know, some people, you know, didn't like his delivery. We did some drill work, some some finished drills to get the ball, uh, his ball flight a little bit better. And uh, that's all I was happy with is he liked it. He had confidence in it. And uh, he went out and, and just, you know, has put together a pretty good run here lately and got himself a nice contract with the Toronto Blue Jays. And when you're talking finish, you know, and this is for people listening in, are you talking arm, body? When you're talking about trying to get through and finish, what are you looking at when you know somebody's not finishing? Yeah, I, I like I like guys, you know, as they rotate the torso and the arm comes through and they're posting up on that front side, they're staying through their target. You know, a lot of guys will 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 you know land that front knee doesn't brace very well, it keeps bending, the hips keep rotating, the, the, the torso keeps rotating, the head keeps rotating, the arm could be late, and, and then the, you just get scattered balls. That's why, you know, earlier I was talking about, you know, watching balls at the plate. I stand in the batter's box. I love to stand in the batter's box and just watch ball flight, watch the ball come in, see where his hand is, and then start working backwards. You know, you start working, uh, uh, okay, his hand's in a good position, but why? You know, he's posting up on that front leg. He's anchoring himself to stay stable when he lands, and he's going through the target. He's not continuing to rotate. You know, when you continue to rotate, you're going to get your, your trunk to lean uh, to your glove side or you're going to, uh, you know, lower your arm slot just to get balls inside that strike zone. So, you know, as I'm working backwards and I'm looking at the, the ball flight coming in and, and how many strikes he can throw, then I'm looking at his, you know, him landing. You know, how is he landing? Is, he, is his front ankle st stable? Is it working up the chain? Is that front knee stable? Are those hips rotating and then blocking you know i think you've probably heard the term blocking but able to to block and not continue to rotate does that trunk come over does he get his head on line and then you know is the, he throwing the front foot shot? was always one for me like the, the guys that threw hard with command they were able to stay on their front foot longer in a better position way way after finish a hundred percent and you'll see guys that'll uh, appear to fall off the mound but they watch they, their front foot yeah, just they it stay stays. on the ground and they let the ball go and they're st they're still in that ground and they're still moving forward and then they bail out. 
Uh, and then there's guys that, you know, land on their front foot and they're sliding all over the place and they can't anchor themselves. You know, when you're walking, you're walking and you put one foot in front of the other and you're stable when you land. And uh, so I, I really, you know, the load and go drill where you're just spread out and loading and going and you're staying on that front foot and you're anchoring and you're taking that chest as you rotate and that chest is getting over your front side and that front leg is coming back a little bit and blocking. So your hips kind of, you know, stop or retract and come back. I think, you know, that's one of the best drills in baseball. Just, to, you know, I'm all about getting the hand out in front. Where's that hand? Where's that hand? And, and then we go back and look at the delivery of how we can maintain that hand in that angle of, of, of throwing quality strikes. Do you like the three batter rule for the relievers? I, I'm not, I'm not in on uh, changing all these traditions, you know, uh, you, you take away your matchup lefty out of it. Like as soon as that was coming out, I'm like, you're taking money away from a guy that could come in and get one left-hander out of game. Yeah. I mean, I, the, the, all these new rule changes are going to be interesting. I, we do need to speed up the pace of play. The uh, minor league and, games were much better. The, the, yeah. Yeah. You know, with all the games I went and watched the grasshoppers, I know it was probably a little quick for them with 14 seconds and 18 seconds, but the games were much faster. Now there's no yeah, TV, I, yeah. there's no commercials. Like it's still, are, are you going to take commercials out of major league baseball? That's the quickest way to, to speed up a major league game is to get rid of the commercials, which are never going to happen. I, 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 a long time ago, just seven innings, just play seven innings. Those things get over in 220, yes. but everybody wanted to keep the record books intact. But for me, you know, I never played the game for record books or, or to be in the Hall of Fame. That was never any of my intention. My intention was to win. And, um, you know, whether it's seven innings, five innings or nine innings, my, that, that's what I always set forth to go out to do to win the games. But, you know, Major League Baseball does an unbelievable job. Right. And um, I think the new rules are going to be great for the game. The three batter, you know, I don't know how much it really uh, changed the pace of play. Um, you know, it's just a different dynamic. It's not bad. It's not a bad rule. I, I, you know, it's not that I don't like it. I just, you know, go back and think about, you know, those. Well, if you can't get three batters specials. out, that's going to add to the length of the game. If your reliever that you just brought in can't get three batters out. Right. Right. Cause well, you're, you're, you're always looking for that, that, um, new guy to come into the game, right. That lefty, even though he's still coming in, you're, you're trying to get two out of three lefties or a good matchup, knowing that some teams are going to pinch hit and you don't get the matchup, but he's good enough against probably the guy they're going to bring in. But, you know, you look at a big league game, once that uh, lefty or righty comes in after six innings, there's probably somebody else warming up for that fourth hitter. Did you have a, a lot of different styles coming out of the pen for you guys with your staff last year? Um. Yeah, I mean, we had we had some arm angle guys, uh, we had some slider guys, we had some below guys a little bit. You know, we didn't have probably um, you know our, our 2018 bullpen where we, we were really good, but uh, we got a lot of guys that you know were six year free agents that we took chances on. Uh, Sam Mull, Acevedo, uh, uh, Puck had a, a great year as a reliever. Uh, Jimenez and Jackson, some of these guys that uh, you know made their major league debuts. I think uh, somebody said we had 18 or 19 pitchers make major league debuts last year. And, you know, it's exciting. It, it, you know, it was a different year. It's a, it, every year is a different year. And um, I love you know, last Puck, year, by the way, AJ Puck was in high school when I was coaching at Iowa. So I've, I've had a crush on AJ Puck forever. Yeah. How do you not like that? I mean, big body like lefty with, that, with, a, you know, with a different arm angle too. Yeah, great slider. You know, he's got a really, really good changeup. Uh, I'm hoping he buys into using it again this year. Didn't use it much last year. Uh, the fact that, uh, you know, it was his first year out of the bullpen and, you know, you know, a whole new role for him. And, and, you know, some of these guys are just, like I said earlier, trying to get out there and breathe a little bit and understand what they can do. I mean, we got, you know, we had a lot of saves from closers that were rookies last year. Acevedo, Jackson. Uh, Jimenez, um, you know, th those guys stepped in uh, Sear and, and had some saves from guys that had never pitched in the big leagues. So, you know, for me, that was a fun dynamic to just watch guys go out there and compete. And, and uh, you know, you still got to make it fun. You got to come to work every day with a purpose and a process. And the process is to, you know, 
watch these guys get better and then step in when needed to get them better. And, and then, you know, hopefully we've developed that relationship that this year we can take that process and that, you know, development a, a step farther with, with our guys. So say you have a guy like Puck that you want him to throw his change up more. Will you relay that to the catcher? Like, Hey, we need to try to mix some change ups in for him. Yeah. You know, we, we have a, uh, 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 a series meeting every, you know, every series we have a meeting. Uh, I being left-handed, I took the left-handed relievers and really dove into their game planning. And, uh, and um, I did the starters and uh, our bullpen coach last year, Marcus Jensen did the right-handed relievers. And so when we had our meetings, you know, we broke it into left-handed relievers and right-handed uh, relievers. I, I led the left-handed meeting and Marcus led the right-handed meeting. And there would be times where I'd say to, to, you know, to AJ, Hey, this is a good candidate for you to try to, you know, throw some change-ups to, and maybe uh, Sneed, Sam Mole, and some other guys lefties that we had down there in Pucker, you know, I might say, uh, you know, backdoor this guy more for you, or you get to elevate this guy a little bit better. You're, you're, and we get data, uh, Pike Goldschmidt, one of our analysts uh, puts together a great heat map for us. And uh, it's tailored to the individual. It's not tailored to just anything else, but to the individual. And uh, we, we put the best game plan together we can, and and we collaborate with the player and try to get them to do it. But, you know, the heat of the moment comes and the catchers are out there. Sean Murphy, you know, who we just lost to the Braves. Uh, Langoliers did a great job. I expect him to, you know, step right in and, and do great things behind the plate because I've been fortunate to have some unbelievable catchers. Steve and Vote. I mean, it's, it's, it's been uh, uh, Josh Fegley. It's been a lot of, lot of great guys, LaCroix, that we've been able to have behind the plate. And uh, But to get them to understand the plan and buy into it is important too because right now they're pressing the buttons on the pitch com and – and hopefully we can get uh, – hopefully A.J. can break that out a little bit more next year. Have you enjoyed Pitchcom? Do, do you like I it? Re- I love it, man. I, I really do. You know, it, it – uh, you know, there's still, you know, a, a lot of, uh, you know, per se, possibly relaying signs from second base. But that's that's kind of on us, you know. Some pitchers still have a hard time of, of hiding the ball from the runner at second base. You know, you look at some guys, they don't even want to get a lead anymore. They're, they're more fired up about relaying a sign to the to the catcher or to the hitter than they are about uh, getting a good secondary. So it's it's on us to to make the adjustment to, to hide the baseball. It's on us that the catchers don't move in a certain way to tip pitches because a lot of teams dedicate a lot of time to uh, – you know, pitch tipping. And, um, you know, when you have a lot of resources, you, you, uh, you can delegate different jobs to people. For this off season, is it individualized for the pitchers that you have coming back as far as when they pick the ball back up, if they shut down? I mean, do you have guys that are still going, a majority of them still going, some shut down? How are you, how are you relaying that to them? Yeah, I'm trying, you know, I, I keep in contact with each guy through text message, maybe a phone call every you know, 10, 11, 12 days or, you know, open line of communication, whatever, you know, last year you couldn't do anything. So, um, you know, our bullpens start in January. We got, uh, you know, we got 10 bullpens wrapped up in the off season that they can throw. Uh, if they want to do live ABs, they can throw two live ABs if they want. And then, then, the, you know, we set a guideline uh, and then our strength and conditioning program and our, our arm care program, program through our uh, athletic trainers you know it's all baked into what we're doing and then the communication and the collaboration with the pitchers starts to come in you know some guys are at a facility some guys want to do something some guys want to you know add a new pitch some guys want to make sure or start a plyo routine that have never started a plyo routine so what we're doing is just kind of you know communicating collaborating if there's something different off the grid off the guideline that we have hey i'm all in you know, this is what we do. This is what these guys do. These pitchers want to throw because that's what they do for a living. And, you know, nowadays, you know, when, you know, when we played 30 years ago, I was fortunate to, to grow up in Arizona. I can just go outside. Now, you know, you got all these great facilities around the country and in the Northeast, these guys are hitting year round. They're going into their facility year round. They want to work. Uh, the signing bonuses are getting better uh, that these guys can actually, I think the, the hope, hopefully the pay is 
going up. I, I remember last year that now they got to pay for the minor leagues players housing. I mean, I remember my first check. That was the biggest right? switch for those guys um, talking to the guys that would come through Greensboro is they felt like the quality of life for the minor leaguers was much better this year because they weren't having to worry about getting housing coming out of spring training. Yeah. I, I remember, you know, when I played sleeping on floors, I remember, you know, I, I got, you know, traded to the Red Sox, sent out from one team to another. Now you're, you're trying to find a place to live in June. Then you get sent to another and you're trying to find places and, and, and you're making, you know, $1,400 a month. My first check uh, from the Orioles Bluefield Orioles that I still have the tickets, the stub, $336. So you got to pay rent with that. I think meal money back then was $12 and 50 cents. So you're at, you know, you're not eating great because you're just trying to eat, you know, and, and this soup that you got during spring training was like, um, you know, broth, two chicken noodle strips and, and a square piece of chicken, you know, but, you know, I think the organizations have recognized these guys are such good investments now that, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, they've all stepped up on the food. They've stepped up on the housing. The pay has come up. It's great for the players, you know, uh, but, you know, when I was playing, it was just a struggle to, to find a place to live all the time. Your guys that are maybe dinged up a little bit during the year, but get through what's the difference for them maybe trying to get themselves nursed back to, to hundred well, percent. Well, I think, you know, we got a, a, a great uh, group of uh, trainers and we got a great group of uh, strength and conditioning coaches. And that, that's not just our major league guys. That's top to bottom. You know, these guys are passionate and they really care about what they do each and every day. They have a call sheet that they're doing, being in touch with players, being in touch with the players, strength and conditioning coaches, uh, being in touch with um, the, the athletic trainers of, you know, whatever they need to do, go through and do, you know, once the season ends, we all, you know, scatter around the country and, um, you know, especially our major league guys, they're, they're, they get a, they got a nice Aussie, our massage therapist. They can go see him when they want, you know, uh, Dr. Chester comes in and, and he's the, he's the cracks the backs and rips on your neck or does whatever he does. So, you know, they, they, they live in, in luxury, you know, in the big leagues. So when they go home, they got to find a guy, if that's what their routine is all about we got to help find the, these people for them so uh you know we, we want we want what's best for all our players with post throw i know everybody's different but how much of your guys on your staff are doing a lot post throw or anything post throw is it individualized or or like how much are they doing because i know there's varying thoughts on that now as far as some of the reverse throws or just completely get away from it and let the central nervous system reset. I mean, what are your guys doing as far as post throw? Yeah, I think everybody's different. You know, our, our guys go through, you know, some guys throw the plyo balls. Some guys don't like the plyo balls. Uh, our arm care program has been in place since I've been in the organization starting in 2003. We got a lot of great, uh, you know, like I always talk about our athletic trainers, that they take our guys through a, a great arm care routine. Uh, throughout the course of the five days uh, in between their stars. And then they match it up with the relievers and then they match up our strength and conditioning, our throwing program. You know, you know, what I do at the big league level, since we've had so many, you know, guys from different organizations, I set out cones uh, with distances and watch our guys throw at certain distances, educate them to why they shouldn't throw too much too far too soon or you know i i don't really care about the the distance of the throw as much as the intent of the throw every day i don't think there needs to be a, a big intent every day to throw the baseball you know i do like you to stay in the synchronization of your mechanics i've always used asmi's literature on the average major league pitcher breaks his mechanics down at 135 feet not saying you can't go to 175 but just I'm not a huge guy on these rainbow throws. Just throw it in the air to throw it in the air when you make a living throwing it down. But I understand it, uh, especially if the players like it. You know, you know, at, at one time, you know, I was I would say I was kind of black and white on, on certain issues like, no, you have to do it this way or you have to do it that way. And I've softened that up to understand you know, these players are coming from different backgrounds. And I got to understand that just as much as they're trying to understand what I'm trying to get them to accomplish also. From January 
February, March, how many times would they have been off the mound then and before opening day? Yeah, we, we, we pretty much have our guys. Uh, we got 10 bullpens before they show up. They'll show up. Uh, they throw a bullpen two days off, throw a bullpen two days off, throw a batting practice, and then the starters tr get right into their routine. Now, some of our starters will throw – uh, maybe three bullpens and then a batting practice because I'm immediately trying to get them when they get to camp into their five day rotation. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're going to have uh, maybe 12 starters we're trying to build. Uh, and then we're probably going to have maybe another uh, 25 guys in camp. So you're trying to find guys innings. You're, you're waiting for minor league camp sometimes to throw them into, into other games if possible. Uh, so, you know, you're looking at seven, seven starts for some guys uh, before the season starts. And you're looking at, you know, between seven and 10 relief appearances, depending on, you know, some guys you might slow play it a little bit because of the workload last year. And some guys you want to get a look at early in the, in the spring uh, to see what you got out of them. How are you getting side session work in for your relievers? Well, that's a great question because, you know, uh, a lot of guys, you know, in, in today's day and age, they want to work. And uh, especially like during the season, they, they want to get off that mound. And, you know, I think a 12-pitch side session, you know, two and a half, three hours before the game is, is fine. I, I like our guys off the mound every third day. But in the big leagues, you know, you're warming up five, six days a week sometimes. So you got to have to, you know, kind of monitor their load. We, ha we have a nice algorithm that we use that helps load management of, you know, even even getting up in the bullpen and not pitching in the game. So you're we factoring that in now, it. too, when guys are getting hot, even if they don't go in. Yeah, we'll factor that in. So, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, it, like I said earlier, you know, you want everybody to come to the big leagues, you know, they're mechanically sound and their pitch arsenal is really good and we can just go to work and just worry about game planning the game. But, you know, there are plenty of guys that want to come in and, and want to work on stuff each and every day. And, and sometimes you're, you know, I teasingly say, well, if we're constantly working on it, maybe we got to go back to the minor leagues to, you know, <laughs> they don't like that one. I but, love it. Uh, I love it. You know, I wish I'd had that one. That sounds like yeah, something my dad would have said. Yeah. They don't like that one. And I don't, I don't like using that, but you, you know, you, you gotta be ready to play the game yeah. and, and, and you just got to educate them. Like, Hey, you're pitching tonight or you're probably in the game tonight, or you're the first lefty in, you're the first righty probably in this situation. And, you know, it always falls on, you know, the guy hasn't pitched in two days. He wants to throw a light bullpen. And then what happens? He throws a light bullpen and pitches in the game. Yep. So, you know, I, but I do like our guys off the mound as much as possible because I go back to that throwing strikes, get your hand in a position and, and being able to pitch. And, and I think the more you're off the mound, the, the better pitcher you do become. So, you know, I like our guys off the mound every third day for sure. If the long guy hasn't got off the mound and it's been two full days and he hasn't got off the mound, I'll, I'll suggest, hey, let's get 10 to 12 in here and, and get some pitches in. Will you shorten the catcher up ever? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, just in you case. Know, I, so they're, you know, they're feeling the mound, but maybe not trying to get the ball all the way there. 60 feet, six inches. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, I know like there are, are, uh, you know, some data is out there that flat grounds aren't good for guys. Uh, but I think what they're seeing is it's, it's just as taxing on the arm. I think that the theory was, well, it's not as taxing as the slope. So they should be able to do that more. But what they're seeing now is it's just as taxing throwing off flat ground it is as it is off the, the slope right but you know we got we, we we got we've had a lot of guys over the years that like flat grounds yeah but you know what yeah i'll take the it. pocket i'll take the pocket radar a guy throws 95 he's just throwing 82 and for me it, it, it's between the ears too you got to work on that mental aspect of being able to hit a target and uh, Yasmirio Botit was one of my favorite guys of all time, reliever, very sustainable, pitched, you know, pitched with a below average fastball. But he, he, he'd get out there and do that flat ground every day and just work on moving his ball around at, at 76 miles an hour and feel good about the, the little touch and feel. If I can get him on the mound doing that and bring up the catcher, yep, I like that as well. And then there's some days when you're really, you know, pitch designing, you're going to, you know, you're going to want them to get after it a little bit. You're not going to want them to work on, you know, we're working on a pitch. 
you got to get after this pitch and we got to really see what the metrics say. We can't get in this bullpen and work on a cutter throwing at 81 and there's really no positive feedback out of that. All right, so of your 12 starting pitchers that are coming in spring training, how many of their pregame routines are the same to get ready? Zero. Zero. It's, Zero. You know, it. these uh, – now, you know, now, obviously I go over a um, – you know, my pregame routine and even my bullpens, you're talking about – I like a script. You got like 10-pitch script. Then you got 10 pitches of uh, sequences – and then you've got uh, maybe five pitches of things you're working on. Uh, I always preach, you know, I don't want to really see more than two changeups in a row because the changeup works best off the fastball. You know, you always want to see some elevated fastballs up and into a righty and a breaking ball down and away, an elevated fastball up and into a lefty, maybe a changeup down and away. So I'm talking to the guys about, hey, putting this into your, your program. Most of our guys, you know, they're, they're, they come in with a good uh, sense of idea of what they want to do. Uh, James Caprillion has a great uh, program. Uh, it's, it's the, he likes to stay on the same program all the time. You know, sometimes I got to say, hey, leave me five or six pitches to do something different. But, uh, you know, I, I like that. Separation is preparation. And I like guys that can prepare the, their own stuff because uh, that shows me that they care about – what their career is all about to them. If I care more about their career than they care about their career, we're kind of in trouble. So I love the student of the game. I, I love the guy, you know, uh, we put together, in my opinion, a great, you know, game plan and scouting report, but I also push that all our pitchers put together their own plan and then we meet before and we collaborate it. And I want to hear what they got. And I want to hear their thoughts of why they want to throw, throw Mike Trout this pitch or the, why they want to throw, you know, up in this pitch. And it, 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 now that's when the collaboration can really start when, when they take ownership of themselves. How, how much of that pregame? So, okay, I know this is the leadoff batter that I'm going to face. Do they throw batters then before they go out there? Do they throw innings or is it just kind of touch and feel and then figure it out? Or are they actually going after a batter in the bullpen before they go out on the mound? Yeah, a lot of our guys, you know, we're talking before their um, start in their bullpen, like, hey, th these guys, uh, we can, you know, you're going to face an all right-handed hitting lineup. Here's some of the pitches that that I've seen that, you know, honestly, you know, it's like anything else. People probably, you know, they scout the pitching coach, what what I like to yeah. teach. And, and so there's teams around the league. I understand and I've watched enough to know their philosophies on hitting. You know, who's swinging early, who's uppercutting, what I call uppercutting. They're, they're all for nothing. And who doesn't want to sacrifice moving runners over? And uh, that's when you're, you know, really formulating that plan as well, because you're gaining intel of them just as much as they're gaining intel of you. So now you're, you know, you're talking about, um, you know, to the pitchers, hey, this is what this team likes to do. They're aggressive first pitch early. Uh, you're left-handed. They're going to throw all right-handers at you. They're probably guessing you're going to go away. Once you start seeing them, you know, take what you give them on the ball in the outer half and they go to right field, you got to make the quick adjustment to come inside a little bit earlier. And, or, you know, there are times where guys will pitch uh, against one team and in their next starts against the same team. So, uh, you know, and, and then you got the data that tells you to pitch them one way. And then you're thinking, well, is that hitter thinking we're going to pitch him that way? Cause we have constantly pitching him that way. And then when do you get him off of the sequence to get back onto the sequence? So, you know, that's the, that's what I call got to play the game within the game a little bit, throw him, throw him, you know, if he's a high ball hitter, throw it a little bit higher than high in a certain situation, or if he's a low ball hitter, throw it, see if he'll chase it a little bit lower in a certain situation. So there's some cat and mouse, that well, goes pitch on, off but... the report with nobody on base, pitch off the report. So when you got guys in scoring position, you can go to the report. Yeah, you're up seven nothing in the, in, the, in early in the game. All right, maybe I'll throw this pitch and see what happens with nobody on, something like that. That's that's that game within the game. But you know, it's it's a lot different now nowadays with the scoreboard. You know, uh, I can tell you that there's some pitchers that probably had a little bit higher ERAs when they're up eight, nothing because they're attacking the strike zone a little bit more. And then there's some nowadays, the pitchers, you know, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to risk my numbers giving up two runs just to throw another inning. So they, they, they won't do that. They just constantly throw their game, which is, which is fine. Uh, but that's just what happens is, you know, 
probably some guys, you know, pitched the scoreboard and, and went a few innings longer, but they might have given up a run or two more than they did in the past. And, uh, you know, that's where the game's changing on that. But the game planning is, is, is important to me, uh, and I try to make it important to them. And uh, most definitely they're involved in – as much as the catchers are too. I mean, we're going to miss Sean Murphy. Sean Murphy put, you know, helped put the game plan together a lot last year. And um, I got a lot of uh, respect for Shay Langelier as our new guy who will probably be our guy. And uh, for doing the same, I think Murphy, uh, you know, showed him the, the right way. Him and Steven Vogt last year showed him the right way to do it. And uh, I think we're not going to skip a beat in the game planning area. With catchers, with glove patterning and the amount that they're moving, how are you helping pitchers find their, their location and their target and whatever they're going to throw through? Because it may not be the glove anymore because the glove may on, be on the ground for some catchers. How are you helping pitchers kind of locate where their target's going to be? Yeah, that's that's a great question because we, we've had a lot of discussion this year about it, about, you know, uh, the pitcher just starting to leave for the leave the rubber and now all of a sudden that glove goes down to get yeah. that low to high action. Uh, you know, it's important that our pitchers and our catchers have that conversation and the conversation, you know, obviously some pitchers are like, man, if you're moving too much, you know, I, I just see too much movement. Can you try to hang on a little bit longer? So uh, Marcus Jensen, our catching coach, you know, took took the initiative to really get involved in uh, glove positioning. And we're, we're going to do it even more this offseason about, you know, the, the best spot for each and every pitcher who really likes it. And, um, you know, I think the communication and the collaboration between the, the staff and the catcher and the pitcher is important about, you know, hey, I, I like that glove to stay still. I, I want you to be bigger or, hey, I don't mind if you get real small and, and make me uh, feel like I'm throwing it into a, uh, a tin cup. You know, when I played, I, I, I used the knees. I used the shoulders. I used the cup. I always felt like I could do that and kind of visualize, you know, where my ball was landing. You know, the top been a of the lot catcher's better. head. I mean, if you're trying to elevate the top of the catcher's head, it's not like the catcher's going to – I mean, everybody's like, well, his gloves – I'm like, well, if they're trying to go up the ladder, the catcher's not going to put his glove up there. You're going to have to use something else for frame of reference. Yeah, 100%. So it, it, it's uh, – you know, it's a great topic. Uh, and, you know, now I don't know when the robo-umpire is going to get behind the plate and it's Hopefully not really going to matter. Yeah, you know, when that time comes, that, that catcher can just kind of uh, – set easy and but you know you set easy sometimes now, now you're tip pit you know, you're tipping a pitch you know and something's getting relayed from somebody and uh so catchers have you know setting up late you know sometimes you got a runner at second base who's good at relaying signs you, you, you got to go out there and say hey we know he's relaying and we got to just you know do the best we can to, to set up late you know set up one spot move it move it uh, as he lifts up set up another stay there so you know, but that's a, that's a really uh, important thing for our guys to know what they like. Who helped you transition from playing to coaching? Because that's a tough transition. Who helped you make that transition getting into coaching? Man, I've had a lot of mentors. You know, I, I, uh, Marty Demerit, who is uh, the rehab pitching coordinator with the Tampa Bay Rays. Um, you know, day one, when I walked in as a pitching coach, I was probably a little bit, you know, I was overweight, you know, I probably drank too many iced teas. And he said, good Lord, you already got that pitching coach body. That's a beauty. But he taught me how to work. You know, he, he taught me how to show up early. He taught you how to leave or late and, and grind each and every day. And, and uh, you know, if you don't feel like you've made an impact, stay and think about it and, and understand, you know, what you're doing. And then, you know, Ron Romanek, unbelievable pitching coordinator. Gil Patterson, unbelievable pitching coordinator, who's still the pitching coordinator today with the Oakland A's, who, who, who taught me a lot. You know, each guy taught me something different. And, and those are the three pitching coordinators that I have had. Gary Ruby also with the Pirates. Those are the four pitching coordinators that I've had, you know, leading into, you know, being a pitching coach in the big leagues. But I also had minor league pitching coach Miguel Bonilla, Rick Rodriguez, Craig Lefferts. Uh, uh, Jim Kaufman. I mean, just, just guys that, that, you know, really uh, Scott Love Camp, guys who's with the Yankees now that, that really kind of, you know, I, maybe not invested in me, but I kind of looked up to at the time or, or wanted to listen to when they talked, I wanted to listen pitching. 
And, uh, you know, going to seminars have always been great. And, you know, I mean, Keith Lippman, our farm director for you know, the Oakland A's 52 years, probably the biggest influential guy in, in sports for me. I mean, the guy made me read books every off season, you know, and, and present it to the coaching staff. I mean, it, do you it's remember, just been a, do you remember some of the books? Mostly Maxwell. We read uh, John Wooden's uh, book, uh, The Pyramid. We, uh, who moved my Who moved my cheese? We read that. Uh, Ten uh, irref- irrefutable laws. We read Tony Dungy's book, and then you know we we always had to present a um, something to the coaching staff, a chapter, and uh, it was it was awesome. That's just, a life you know, skill too, though. I mean that that's helping a young coach develop, getting up in in front of people in a room and and presenting and like that. All that stuff helps young coaches with life skill stuff. Yeah, I, I could I could remember seeing young coach come in and there's you know they so, some guys would take it to a you know some guys would say I probably did this took it to a whole nother level and we'd have PowerPoint presentations and all this and some guys would just write on the grease board and some guys would just talk but you know sometimes you watch that young coach and you know he don't want to embarrass himself and he's sweating bullets on on uh, you know a, a chapter out of the book whether it's character or something like that talking about what is character or what is labeling and what is creativity and, and they would get up there and just not want to make a mistake and they'd sweat and and we'd tease them all the time like oh man you better have a good presentation or lips going to be upset and, but uh you know the Oakland A's organization has been you know you know, it's been They've a family. Been been advanced. You know, I, yeah. Harvey Dorfman, you know, who wrote Mental Ass, he started with the athletics, you know, when Lou Russo was there, the Keen brothers, like the Keel brothers, they, they yeah. kind of started the peak performance in baseball in the eighties. And, you know, I, I got a lot from Dorfman's book, but I, that's, yeah, I, that's what yeah, I've always um, thought about the athletics is because of Dorfman. Because Dorfman was, well, you know, forever. when, uh, when Gil Patterson came to the organization in, uh, Oh, oh, eight. Uh, no, he, he was the pitching coordinator years before with the A's as well when Harvey and them were there and uh, and Carl Keel. And so, which was great. We were reading a chapter out of the book every day to our, our pitching staffs. And before that, you know, we, we'd all, you know, we'd, we'd work on the mental aspect of the game. But, uh, you know, we would literally take a take a chapter for – you know, I probably didn't do it every day, five days a week, though, and and read a chapter and, you know, print it out, give it to them and just kind of let's go. Let's talk about whatever the ABCs of the day were and just get some conversation 15, 20 minutes before or after our scouting meeting that day. And it just would engage in us. And, and uh, you know, I miss those days because, you know, now it's like, man, these guys are on the go. I mean, our guys get to the ballpark at one o'clock and, and you're, you're, they're in the weight room. They're in the cryo room. They're in doing, uh, getting ready for the game. I mean, there's so much action going on with a big league player nowadays that, you know, sometimes you, you really got to schedule out, Hey, tomorrow, me and you, I want to talk. And, um, but you know, it's a lot of fun, uh, uh, hopefully make an impact on, on, you know, not just players, but young men. When are your pitchers able to get their lifting in? Obviously, starters way different than a reliever, but when your relievers, when are they able to get into the weight room? You know, there, there, there's guys who like to lift at 1 p.m., and then there's guys who like to lift after the game. So, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, prioritized to their liking and our strength and conditioning staff. You know, they're there early. They stay late, and they get it done. You know, some guys – don't want to lift before they pitch they'd rather wait till after and our strength and conditioning guys support that and uh, some guys like to do it uh beforehand and you know all these programs are you know pretty much tailored by the strength and conditioning department uh of what this guy is working on and 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 uh, josh cuffey and and steve candelaria and now we got a we hired a biomechanist uh, ethan stewart you know uh, the good thing about uh, those types of guys is, you know, if we if I see a guy doesn't have stability somewhere, you know, he's bailing out, something's going wrong, he constantly collapses the front knee, what can we do to maybe help him? Now, there are also times in the big leagues where that guy who's been collapsing his front knee for seven, eight years and, and he's really good, 
I ain't going to mess with that. That that's that's career suicide, you know. So you know, you, people got to understand that as well. You know, results. We go back to the results matter most. And uh, you know, a guy's having you know, comes up to the big leagues and and he, he he you know has a hard time addressing this and he can't compete at the big league level. Uh, you know, we'll address it, especially when they're really young. Uh, you know, the young pitchers. Uh, can't front leg block or, or over rotate or don't have strength. You know, for me, strength matters. You know, the guys that have strength, they matter because they, they're sustainable longer. So uh, it's important uh, that uh, our strength and conditioning department, you know, makes that impact. And they do a great job of it, of making that impact that, hey, strength matters. If, you know, our athletic training department, if you can't keep that shoulder strong and that arm's dropping, you know, where's that elbow going? So, you know, we got good people running departments that, that make sense. And now it's just like, let's let's piece it together and, and do what's best for the player to have success. Do you have a fail forward moment? Do you have something you thought was going to sidetrack you, but looking back now is one of the best things that happened to you? Ooh. I, I think, you know, I, you know my, uh, my moment probably came with Pittsburgh in um, 02. Um, you know, basically they said I probably wasn't going to have a job and I had to go find a job. And I, and I found a job with, uh, with, with Oakland. And, uh, you know, one of the things that was said to me is, um, you know, I mean, I was in Pittsburgh and I, and I, I love the organization, a lot of people, a lot of great people there, but three years, three farm directors, uh, two, two and a half GMs. Cam Bonifay is great. We've got a new GM. They just don't know who you are. And, and that's kind of kind of got me, but it, it turned out to be a blessing because I found the A's and I found Keith Lippman, and uh, you know they were you know, they got me my winter ball job at 32 years old in winter ball where half my pitching staff was older than me. Uh, the next year, uh, you know, I was going to go back the next year to Mochi's, and, and then then all of a sudden um, I did the Arizona Fall League and. And, uh, you know, I, I always love to be ahead of the curve and progressive and, and trying to find something new and studying it before somebody else gets to it. And uh, nowadays it's, a, it's you know, it was, it was better years ago. Uh, but nowadays the, the open lines of information with social media, you're, you're thinking, dang, you know, I'm ahead of the curve on this. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're like six months later going, dang it, we're not ahead of the curve anymore on this. They're starting to understand this or this. This, uh, you know, I still get where companies are sending me product to look at. And I'm like, yeah, I love this. This is, but then all of a sudden I see another organization just bought 30 of them, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's just, uh, it's um, the creativity is, 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 is always been something I've enjoyed. Do you have to have a social media presence now to get a job? Oh, good, good question. I mean, there, there, you know, obviously there's a lot of people who are, uh, out there, you know, trying to, to, you know, put their name out there. And, you know, if you're a guy that, uh, you know, doesn't have the connections, but you're writing good papers and, and, and publicizing, look, look, it might be, I, I read everybody. I the mean, thing that it, cracks me up, it's like, okay, they're, they're all over social media and then they get a pro job and they can't be on social media anymore. <laughs> Cause, yeah. Because <laughs> the organization's not going to allow them to be on social media anymore. <laughs> Well, they just get scared of it too, yes. you know. Um, yep. you, you know, sometimes when you get into pro ball, you find out what you don't know. You know, a, a lot of things that you know I laugh about is a lot of people will say, you know, uh, well, you know, the pro coaches just kind of throw out the bats and balls, but you know, the pro coaches aren't giving away their playbook. Yes. You know, I, I get out there on social media sometimes and, and state some cases. Uh, but I'm not going to get out there and, and and throw the big playbook out there, and, and you know I'll throw out results or, matter. Like you can't you can't share that information. Like you're you're trying to win games at the big league level. Yeah, I mean we all know you got to throw a strike. Yes. So so you know I'll share that with everybody. Throw more strikes. Uh, that, change speeds. That's your you know, biggest I mean, tip for youth coaches, at parents, yeah. and players, right? Throw more strikes. Yeah, put it over to plate and see what happens. But, you know, I, I think, you know, what, you know, what people don't remember or, or fail to realize is, is when you're in the game for a long time and, and you want to learn and you want to understand, you've learned what, what once was, but you're also learning what 
is now. Yep. When you're in the game real quick at 25, 26, you haven't learned what once was. So when I got into pro ball, I wanted to learn what once was. Uh, that would help me for what is going on now. What did you use to teach? Why did you use to teach it? Um, and and gain the knowledge that used to happen or used to be. And, and look, man, I, I'll be honest with you. The game doesn't change. You're still trying to throw strikes. You're still trying to get three outs. You're still trying to, you know, sometimes have them put a ball in play. Two strikes, you're still trying to wipe a guy out. It's just we can measure it a little bit different with technology and understand, hey, you should probably throw in this pitch more. You know, one thing that always gets me is when, you know, I hear if your breaking ball is your best pitch, throw it more. Well, I'm not telling you to throw it more. I'm telling you to throw it more when you're supposed to be throwing it. If you're just throwing it to throw it more and you're laying it inside the strike zone and counts that you probably shouldn't be laying it in the zone, you're going to get beat up because, you know, quite frankly, a breaking ball inside the strike zone is a hanger. And if you constantly throw hanging breaking balls inside the strike zone, you're going to constantly back up third base. Yes. So my, my theory is, you know, you don't necessarily throw a certain pitch more just because the data tells you, you got to break down that data and throw it more when you're supposed to throw it more. Yep. Well, how do you handle the big league schedule with routine sleep, nutrition? How, I mean, you've been doing this a long time now. What do you have any tips for handling the schedule from a sleep and nutrition standpoint? I'm absolutely terrible at those. I don't get any sleep and my nutrition is horrible. So, you know, I mean, you know, when you're putting together a game plan, right. And you're up at three o'clock in the morning. I mean, I, I could tell, I can't tell you how many nights Marcus Jensen will, will uh, ding me at like two 45, three 30 in the morning. Boom. I'm finished because, you know, I, I can't do it all. And Marcus and I put the game plan together, our bullpen coach at the time. We got, we got a new bullpen coach, Mike McCarthy's coming on, and Marcus is going to transition with us in the dugout a little bit. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, it's going to be a lot of nights where he's going to – I'm going to say, hey, did you got the guys done yet? Because what, what we do is, you know, pretty much I'll take, you know, seven or eight hitters and do a, just a master report, and then the bullpen coach will take the rest, do a master report, and then I take all the starters, all the left-handed relievers, and we start blending these reports into what our guys can do well from the data we're given from Pike Goldschmidt and the heat maps. And then we start putting the individual game plans together. And if you don't start that sometimes during a series, you know, you're going to be up all night. So off days and day games are really, really good for me uh, the day before a series, a night game followed by another uh, team coming in is not so good because I'm rushing because I, I hate doing advanced work on one team while we're playing another. So the sleep for me doesn't happen as much as probably I probably should. The nutrition, I, I've done a better job myself, but you know, my first year in the big leagues, I picked up 35 pounds in a heartbeat. I mean, there's, a, you know, there's there's food all over the place. Well, we got that's, that's both too, because that's lack of sleep, and then also there's food everywhere. Because that's really the only time that that your body can reset is is through sleep. So you are going to gain weight if you're not getting enough sleep. You're going to gain weight. Yeah, so I better get to sleep now. Hey, <laughs> you ever have pitchers that you don't share anything with? It's like okay, we're, we're throwing up mental roadblocks for this guy, telling him any information. A hundred percent. I mean, you know, there, there's some guys you dummy the reports down to, hey, first ball, fastball hitter. Uh, he's a guy you can owe to approach the first pitch. Then it's more hard away, soft away, finish with an elevator fastball. Boom, next guy. And then there's guys you get a little bit more detailed in. You know, the, the, the technology is is great, but it's also harmful. Yes. Because, you know, you start reading the track man or the reps soto information and now all of a sudden you're trying to make a pitch that you know you're probably skill set can't make that pitch yet you know it's hard to tell a guy hey your skill set's not as good as you know this guy to make these pitches you know that's why you got to concentrate on you know throwing strikes winning counts and then we'll look at the metrics of the pitch you know that's kind of how the order i look at it can you throw strikes can you win counts okay now what pitches do we need to improve in certain, you know, breaks or spins or, or what have you? But a lot of guys, they want to constantly improve. And I get that. But when you start tinkering with something, you know, I, I'm a firm believer. When you start going looking for problems, you'll find them. Yeah. I mean, you, you got all these slow-mo cameras 
and you got all this data on the kinetic chain and and the and the kinetrax information gives you everything and if you're one of those guys that uh you know over processes something and you, and you come in and go oh my god look my, my my hands are a tad late but he doesn't realize he catches up you know as he's going down the mound or or my head wax but he doesn't realize no but your head whacking look at the video your head whacking the ball's already gone yep. or i mean there's there's just so much information that that when you're trying to strive to be the best, you can also have a setback because you're just trying to do things that you're incapable of doing. Making Hall of Fame pitches before you can make A-ball pitches. You know, make the A-ball pitches first, and then let's graduate you to to the double-A pitches and into the to the big league pitches. So I, I see that well, the technology. Competition is time to focus on your strengths, correct? 100%. Clean up your weaknesses on the side, and when it's time, when the bullets start flying, it's time to focus on your strengths. Yeah, I, I think if you just master your strengths, master your strengths, master your strengths, and then we can work on a weakness. If you're constantly working on a weakness to become a strength, your strengths start suffering. Yep. Yep. What are some final thoughts or something I should have asked you that I didn't? Oh, man. Uh, well, my best pitch was my pickoff move. <laughs> uh, let's get that out of the way. Uh, yes, yes, I did uh, give up Michael Jordan's first minor league spring training hit, uh, which was awesome in itself because I actually had a press con my first press conference ever. And um, I think it was a guy from the Boston Globe wrote, wrote an article and he said, uh, the guy at the plate, uh, no, the guy on the mound was all state. The guy at the plate was all world. And he, he named it me. He said the redhead from Arizona was an all state basketball player facing Michael Jordan and all the, the greatest in the world, you know, in basketball, but we're on a baseball field. So that was kind of cool to, to experience that. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't know that, but, uh, it was a great experience. Maybe one day, uh, I can run up to Charlotte and try to find him and play him in one-on-one. -on -one. It. See what happens. Scott, I appreciate I your time. I challenge you, Michael. I challenge you. Appreciate your time, Scott. Thanks for jumping on with me. I, I appreciate you having me.